celebration of this one day that we've chosen to celebrate the birth of Christ. Some may argue, well, it was in April, which we know. So why do we celebrate it in December? Because that's the day that we chose to do it. That's all there is to it. And so it's amazing how throughout the generations, people have always risen up to wipe out that name, wipe out the story. And the more they try and attempt to remove the beauty and the purity of that story, the stronger it gets. You cannot do it. You know, I was amazed that when I went to pick up our first two adopted children, we wanted to get back to America to celebrate the birth of Christ with the Christmas that Americans are so voluptuous about and generous. And we, we were stuck in China and it was cold and miserable. And I thought it's going to be a terrible Christmas. And I want to tell you something. There was more celebration of Christmas there than I've seen in most countries. It was so amazing that a, a country, a communist force that has literally wiped out God from their books, from their belief, from their philosophies. And yet there was Christmas, there were festivities, beautiful Christmas trees. And the message of Christ was right there in China. And nobody was arguing about whether this was the day that Jesus died or that it was a pagan holiday. In their simplicity, they just knew that there was a story about someone who came for them. And here we were picking up two little lost orphans because of Jesus Christ, who was himself adopted by Joseph. And so I want you to know it's very dear to us when we think of what he has caused us to do, Jane and myself, my family, and our team. It's very precious to us. And so this time of year is very beautiful for us because of that. And so I'm sure it is to you. And let me just say this to you. If you, perchance, are lonely, you have nobody to celebrate with. Because, you know, you know, we've been in hospitals around Christmas time with our, our children. And it's, it's so full. People want to take their lives. People are so unhappy because they're alone or they lost somebody or they're just plain miserable and people get sick it's amazing how when you're alone and you have nowhere to go that you'd even find your way to a hospital in the hope to find some solace and comfort but we want you to know that we are here for you we are you are our family and we want you to enjoy Christmas with us and so that's why we're doing what we're doing today and I sense there are many of you that are alone. Well, welcome to the den. Welcome to our candlelight meeting, our time together, and our Christmas Eve. Today we're going to just share from our hearts to you, with you, and then also have a communion to remember him for what he did for us. He told us to do that. He said, in remembrance of me, do this as often as you can. And so today would be a very appropriate day, just before the end of our year, to celebrate him and to give him a gift. So without any further ado, let me take you to my little message that I have prepared for you. And this is where it starts. When you think about the garden and creation, and when you think about what God did for mankind, choosing a planet, Equipping that planet so that they could dwell and they could have dominion, they could enjoy life, and there were needs that this being had. The biggest need was <coughs> for fellowship with God. And God knew that and they knew it. But somebody else also knew it when God created Adam and Eve. <coughs> when God created Adam and Eve, there was a serpent. There was an enemy that had been kicked out of heaven because of rebellion and wanting to be like God. Lucifer said these words, he said, and he made five statements, which I'm not going to repeat now, but it's written in Isaiah. The desires that he had, and one of the desires that he had was, I will rule over 
the stars of God. I will rule over the mountain of God. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Five times he said, I will. The stars of God speaks of you and I, God's creation, God's messengers. He wanted dominion over you. He said it before God even created mankind. This is what he had wanted more than anything else. One of the other things he said is, I will, I will rule over the great cloud. And we know that the Bible speaks about being surrounded by a great cloud of witness. He wanted to rule over them. He knew that something was in the making. But the final thing that he said was, and then I will be like the most high God. And when, I, when you read the interpretation of that, it was, I will be El Elyon. And that means I will be the possessor of heaven and earth. That's what his desire was, Lucifer. But he could never do it. There was no way that he could do it, except if God would become a man and he would rule over him. That's how he thought about it. Would God ever become a man? It would not be necessary at all. And so his desire was, I will be the Most High God. And the word, the, the, the title El Elyon means the possessor of heaven and earth. I will be the possessor of heaven. And if not heaven, I will be the possessor of earth. Now think about what his, his desires were. And these were written in Isaiah as the prophet captured the thoughts of Lucifer before any before that time God created man he created the earth he created everything but then he came to his prize possession he was going to give to this piece of dust something that he had in his hand he was going to create this creature in his likeness and his image now I'm talking to you today God created man in his, two things he says, in his likeness and in his image. They are two different things. The word image means word. Now, if you stay with me, John explains he was the manifested image of God. Jesus was the image of God. That came to the earth. Now, if you keep that word image in your mind, and let's go back to the garden. In the beginning, God created man in his likeness and his image. Now, that word image in the Greek is logos. That word image speaks of someone. Not an it, but a someone. In the beginning was the Word, image. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God has no beginning. So what beginning was he speaking about in John? In the beginning was the Word, and that Word is image. The image was with God, and the image was God. That image is what God gave to Adam. He placed his son the image of God into Adam. Now, you may be saying, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, image speaks of an expression. It speaks of dominion and power. And so the image of God was given to Adam. Now, the word image means to be like God. It's impossible to be like God unless God is in you. So the word image means to be like God. And the word likeness is to look like God. There is a difference between the two. To look like God is a reflection. A reflection can be, on, it can, you can have a reflection on water that is dead, still water. And the reflection can still be beautiful. So each human being ha has at least this, the reflection or at least to look like God. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually, mentally, in every way. 
But there was a greater dimension, and Satan knew this. That when God gave man his image, he gave him something that would never, would never cause man to stumble if used correctly and if protected. That if, if Satan could get the image of God out of Adam, he would have a chance to overcome Adam and become the possessor of at least of earth, giving him the title of possessor of earth. Now, if you look at that whole picture, you'll see how precious Jesus is. Well, once man, of course, we know what happened. God said, now, I'm giving you a possession that I have no power over. I'm giving you something that you have complete control of and I cannot. I can influence it, but I cannot control it. What is the one thing that you use more than anything in your entire being? Well, in my hands, I talk with my hands. Or my tongue, I speak with my tongue. Or my brain, no, it's your will. And the greatest gift that you can ever give to God is your will because He doesn't control it. Now you think about that. He handed that to mankind and said, that th there's a danger here. If you use this will to do wrong, you will bring upon yourself death. And gave them the warning. Mankind was in the garden who knows how long. But there came a point where what they were not supposed to partake of became desirous to them. I want this. Because it promises great knowledge and great wisdom in that tree of life. The tree of life. And the fruit that had goodness and evil within its knowledge. As you know, man partook of it with his wife. And immediately he knew he was naked. He went from seeing God and seeing the beauty to looking at himself. And the minute that happened, the minute he partook of that and he listened to the voice of the serpent, the image of God was removed from man. He no longer had the ability to have dominion. He could multiply, he could be fruitful. To a degree, he could have power over the earth. But from that point onwards, he was in the likeness of God and God would have to speak to him and send images to him so that he could survive. Now hear me out. This tells me a big story. In that... At that point, when man fell, and he, he dove into darkness, failure, seeing himself as naked and inferior, the enemy knew, I've won the victory. When that happened, it was settled in heaven. I will send my son, the image of God, so that man can once again have my image again now think about him as the image of God the express image of God throughout the Bible in the beginning was the word he was the word now let's move now we realize what happened man fell into in terrible sin the killing of brothers fighting war and so on but now the son of God it had been determined before the eons of time that he would give his life and he was in fact crucified but it still was in man's power to decide by his will whether to partake of the fruit and disobey God and he did so Jesus had been chosen to come to the earth and and a few times before his incarnation he descended descended to this earth in the similitude of man in other words, in a man's body. Why would he do this? Well, I believe that he came and visited man because he wanted to see and know man. The man that he would die for in various circumstances. Four times specifically, he appeared to man. To visit the sons of men, the son of God. And this is going to bless you. The first visit was at the plains of Mamre to Abraham. Abraham sitting outside of his tent, God had appeared to him. Suddenly there were three men that were there. The Bible says Abraham stood before one man recognizing this is God. It was the Son of God. 
I believe that Christ came those few times to the earth to see man and to visit him. The Son of Man stood before Abraham, and we know the story. He speaks a word while Sodom and Gomorrah is in the background, filled with sin, filled with horror, filled with perversion. He looks at Abraham and says, I have come to give you the promise. Gives the promise, sends the word, the image to his wife, Sarah, and says, about this time next year, at the time of life, you shall bear your son. She, it was impossible for her to have children. And the word goes out of the Son of Man's mouth, proceeds, and the image strikes Sarah. And suddenly a miracle takes place. He shares with Abraham and says, Shall I share with Abraham what we're about to do? And that, of course, was the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham stands before him as a friend, which is exactly what God planned for mankind. To be in the image of God means that you are like, you, are, you, you, you have like minds and like thoughts. Friends share things. And he created you also to be someone that he could talk to. The next place that he appeared was to a, a Jacob who was about to become Israel. And take note of where he appeared. The Son of Man appeared at the brook of Jabbok. When, when Jacob left his, his children and his wives behind and said, Wait, I'm crossing over this ford of Jabbok. And he was alone with a man. And that man was the Son of Man. Because Jacob later says, I'm going to die because I've seen God face to face. And that's what Christianity is all about. The Old Testament was God at a distance. The New Testament is God close to us. The Old Testament was, was go to the mountain, go. But the New Testament is come. And that was the difference. Jesus was coming close to them before he would be crucified. Stick with me. I have one beautiful thing to share with you. At the brook of Jabbok, he wrestled. The Son of Man, you see him as a, as a wrestler, as a, as, a, as a soldier, as a fighter. Fighting with Jacob until Jacob was overcoming him. And he says to him, let me go. The Son of Man, God, says to Jacob, let me go. And Jacob says to him, I will not let you go until you bless me because Israel is going to become a nation and then a people. And, and Jacob knew that. And God looks at him, the Son of God, and he says to him, you are no longer Jacob, but you are Israel, for you have prevailed with men and with God. And at that point, the image of God goes into Jacob. The image, you know who the image is. That which Adam lost, God was sending to the earth, preparing his own son. And Jacob looks at this man, knowing it's God, and said, Tell me who you are. What is your name? And Jesus says to him, What interest is it to you what my name is? Think about it. And then he appeared again later beneath the walls of Jericho. And I'm going to read it to you very quickly. And then we're going to prepare for communion. Actually, we're going to prepare to give a gift to the Son of God. I think it's appropriate, don't you? Kim, carry on. I'm getting interested. Well, let me read it to you then out of Joshua chapter 5. And I'm going to start with verse 9. Then the Lord said to Joshua, and I want you to hear what, what happened when Christ appeared as God in male form, human form. Most theologians will agree that this was the Son of God. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Now think about the moment that Christ appeared to man before he died. Before he was born, I should say. Therefore the name of the place is called Gilgal today. In other words, no reproach of Egypt anymore. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. Twilight. I have a whole message on that. And they ate the produce of the land on the day after Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then the manna ceased on that day after they'd eaten the produce of the land. Now you may not understand this, but Jesus is known as the manna from heaven, the bread of life. Here he is telling Joshua, it's the end of Egypt's reproach. 
You're going to eat of this land and then I'm going to give you the plan to how to overcome Jericho. The manna ended that day. And he said, and I can, I've got a whole message on that. Christ is standing there. The manna stops. One day he would become the manna from heaven for mankind. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and look, behold, a man. And the word man in, in the English is capitalized. A man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And he said, No. But as commander of the army of the Lord. Can you imagine Jesus standing before Joshua? Because his name would be Yeshua. And I'll bring you there in a minute. Standing before a manly Yeshua stands, the Christ Yeshua. And says, I am the commander of the army of the Lord, and I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face on the earth and worshipped him and said, What does my Lord say to his servant? And you'll notice something, that whenever an angel came and they fell prostrate before the angel, that the angel would say, Get, on your, get up, I'm not God. This one didn't do it. This was, in fact, God. And he said to him, and, and Joshua fell on his face and worshipped and says, What does my Lord say to his servant? What is the image that you have to give to me? Because you see, man didn't hear God because the image had gone from man. Even though he was in the likeness, the image had gone. The expression of divinity had gone from mankind. And so he needed prophets and he needed people to come and to speak to man. And he said to him, Take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was securely shut and the whole story is about a deliverance and taking of land. What is Christ all about? Giving you back the kingdom that you lost in the garden. From one garden to another garden. From the garden that God gave to Adam to the garden of Gethsemane. God would give back to mankind the dominion that he lost, which is called the kingdom of God. Satan having a heyday throughout the earth. Killing here, doing all kinds of things to his people. Not realizing that one day God would in fact become a man and stand face to face with Satan and overcome him. And it could only be done one way and that was to trick Satan. You know this morning I was praying and worshiping God. I'm doing the alphabet thing. I'm on C today. And I was going through all the C's. Captivating was one of the words I found about him. And one of the words I used about God was cunning. Very cunning at times. Satan had no idea. The rulers of darkness had no idea that when they crucified the Lord, what they were doing. Because they were blinded from it. Because he wanted power. He thought, if I kill this son of God, I could become the possessor of heaven and earth. I'm the possessor of earth now, but not heaven. Please hear me. God appeared in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Babylonian king recognized and said, Look, there's a fourth man in the fire, and he looks like the Son of Man. He was the Son of God. Jesus was in the fourth, the fourth man in the fire. Excuse me. I'm almost done. Now I want everybody to look at Matthew chapter 1. And I'm going to show you something. Oh, he appeared many times that we don't know about, maybe. Jesus coming to the earth, Yeshua. But one day he would come in the form of a child. But just before he came, he visited his own father. Now I'll show you what happened. There was one more appearance of the Son of God that went to his adopted father and said these words. And I thought this was the most beautiful thing that I could share with you today. He appeared to Abraham to Sarah who would be the father of this great nation Israel he appeared then to Jacob who would become the Israel he then appeared to Yeshua Joshua meets Yeshua to tell him that my presence will bring the end to any manna that is needed from heaven for I am the bread of life then he appears in the fiery furnace so that the Babylonians could see who he was. Because it's in a fire that purification took place. And now 
The day has come, the time has come for the Son of Man to be sent from heaven into the womb. But just before that, Matthew chapter 1, verse 16. Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, who was born Jesus, called the Christ. Now, hear what I have to read to you in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. As follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, being a just man... to make her a public example was minded to put her away secretly but while he thought that an angel of the Lord appeared to him can you imagine just before Christ is about to come forth through um, through Mary onto the earth he comes and appears to the man who would be his father his earthly father and said Joseph Son of David, do not be afraid to take to you marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Isn't this cool? He's looking at the man who is going to bring him in his hands into this world when Mary offers him up at the end of her pregnancy. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua. He's talking about himself. And he will save his people from their sins. I think that is fantastic. And you think about it. He's standing on the outside. But he's also on the inside. He goes away. And will not appear again. Because the next appearance. Will be months later. When Mary offers him. To the world. He is born the saviour. He is born the deliverer. Now I'm going to read you one more thing. If you don't mind. You ready? Herod is afraid of this little boy. It's quite laughable. And he tells the wise men to go and search for him and bring him that I may worship him. When they heard the king, they departed and behold... The star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood where the young child was. Then they saw the star and they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. You know, worship is one of the most beautiful things. But worship with a gift is even more beautiful. Look at what it says. And when they'd opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I would like to ask you a favor today. Before we take or share of the blood and the body of Christ. That speaks of a whole story. Can you imagine when Jesus is in his weakest form as as man... God in his weakest form as, of, as man, not eaten 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And Satan, the coward, approaches him. You're at your weakest. I'm going to tempt you to do something so I can take possession of heaven. Bow down and worship me and all of these kingdoms that you've come to take back for mankind. 
I'll give to you so you don't have to go to the cross. That was a temptation. What would have happened had Jesus, the Son of God, God bowed to him? God would have died. No, Kim, I could never receive that. God cannot bow to darkness and death. For whatever you bow to, you become likened to and take on that image. This temptation of Christ was way further than what, way more. The understanding of it is, is way deeper, I should say, than anybody could really understand. Bow before me so that I am Lord over you and I'll give these kingdoms to you, but you won't have to go to the cross. I know it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a strong statement to say, and of course we can, we can exchange ideas about that. But God is standing before the very one that tempted Adam. And here is the last Adam in front of him and says, get behind me. For you see, you will worship the Lord your God and only him will you worship. So you are going to be worshiping me. And he went to the cross and did it for you and I. Today you have eternal life. You have dominion and you have the image of God in you. Now, would you take a moment and say, Lord, on this Christmas day, this Christmas Eve, I'd like to bring my, out of my treasure, something for you to thank you. And then I'll pray that you bring a blessing on our house and our lives over Christmas. Let's pray together. Lord, you have given to us the very, very best. When you gave us your son, Today we celebrate His existence, His reign, His captivating love. And Lord, we are not only going to worship You as we go into Christmas, we're going to come with a gift. And Your gift may be just a little three or four or five dollars, or it may be half ten dollars, it may be a hundred, whatever it is. It's from the treasury of Your heart that matters. Now say this with me. Lord, I will not come empty-handed before you. I want to worship you tonight with my special offering. And I'm going to give it to you on this day where we celebrate your birth. Now I want every person to just pray for a few seconds. Think about what you'd like to give him. And then I want you to do it. And we will worship together and we'll sing another song. Whatever one you choose, Hannah. Every person watching me, please, just take a minute. Give your, give your gift from your treasury to the Son of God because we are in front of Him now. And thank Him for what He gave us. Lord, I pray now, speak to each person. Show them what you would like them to give. Receive the frank frankincense. Receive the myrrh. Receive the gold that comes from a heart that is pure. Amen. Okay, you have the power to do it now. You've been given the will to do something good. There's a red link below your screen. If you don't know about it, you can do it right now. Just take a few minutes and on this beautiful eve of Christmas, you can give your gift with your worship. There's a red link. It takes very, it takes very quick to do. Think about what I told you, the history, how he came and made up his mind to do it. In his weakest form, Satan lost against God. Think about it while you give. Red link below the screen. You can designate it as you wish, uh, but it's your offering, my special offering to God. So we'll so moved I'd really like to just send it in because I don't like doing it on the internet you can also mail in your offering and many of you do that especially at this time when you want to be very generous especially to, to ministries like mine that come into your home and bless you and we love you you can mail it in or if you're sitting there and you feel like texting it go ahead and do it 
Just text 43965, gift and the digital amount. Very good. So put gift, 43965, gift, 5, 10, 15, 25, whatever you feel to do. And we love you for that. Go ahead and do it now. And give him praise when you're doing it. Worship him. Just say thank you. What do you like to do? gifts that have come from the treasury of your beautiful people we offer to you take it Lord with our love and our thanks to you Yeshua our King you are obviously prepared for this moment where we have the bread which represents his body which was broken for us pierced that we may be healed the stripes on his back ripped through his flesh so that we may eat of the bread of life let's partake of that bread of life I offer this to you, Lord, my thanks. And together as a community of people, we partake of this bread. Receive life as you partake. It's coming alive in you. Thank you for your sacrifice, Lord. To give us joy. And in turn he took of the cup. This is my blood. Partake of it as much as you can, as many times as you can, in remembrance of me. We remember you, our Lord. Thank you for your blood that speaks of better things than that of Abel, but of life. Thank you for it. I bless, I bless the wine. Each person all throughout the earth, as they partake of this, I pray, forgive as they forgive. Let's partake of his blood. Ah, the life. The life is in the blood. Now it's time to celebrate. 